Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the second lecture in the first IHF Children's Handball Week. My name is Courtney Gayen. I'm a member of the IHF Media Group and I'm the moderator for this session. To begin with, I will outline the translation options we have available today. We have French, Spanish, Arabic and Russian translation. These are available only if you are joining us on Zoom. You can find them at the bottom of your screen by locating the globe icon marked interpretation and selecting the label for your language. Please note that for Arabic users, you need to select the label Chinese. If you're watching on Facebook right now, one of our team members is going to post the Zoom link so you can still join us on Zoom and make full use of the translation as well. This first IHF Children's Handball Week is the second educational program forming part of the IHF Virtual Academy recently launched to facilitate global online learning. All of this falls under the umbrella of the IHF Education Centre, available at ihfeducation.ihf.info. This first IHF Children's Handball Week comprises a total of six lectures presented by top IHF experts. Today's lecture is presented by a lecturer for the IHF Commission for Coaching and Methods and member of the IHF Handball School Working Group, Craig Rote. Please feel free to ask questions throughout. We are going to stop a few times to address your questions and we'll pass as many of those on to Craig as we can. So Craig, welcome. We are ready for you to begin whenever you're ready. I have a problem here. <laughs> No problem. Hello to everyone and thank you for joining us. This is the second lecture of the first IHF Children's Handball Week. Today, I want to talk to you about how you can build successful handball programs for children, utilizing events and competition to grow the sport in your area. But first, I want to mention questions will be taken several times during the presentation. I will cue you a few, few moments before each to submit them. So let's get started. Today's discussion will begin with a brief glimpse of IHF development outreach and the newly redesigned handball at school program. Then we will look to some studies about what children want from sports and what they need from programs like yours. Finally, we will look to a few event types, specifically leagues, tournaments, and festivals, as we learn how to create successful children's handball programs. In order to improve the quality and quantity of handball playing nations around the world, the IHF created these programs. IHF Trophy for Junior Category Men and Women since 2011, and for youth category men and women since 2018. Emerging nations uh, for U23 category men since 2015. These programs are focused on promoting national team participation and developing in emerging countries and handball at school since 2011 with the redesigned program launching this summer with plans as Dr. Mustafa spoke yesterday to reach 50 million children over the next four to six years. Let's take a quick look at this program and its investment in encouraging events and competitions. Our first booklet was published this summer with more booklets to come that will focus on training and development. The first booklet covers our philosophy, methodology and curriculum, as well as providing a thorough background of the rules of the game and the basic technical skills for the sport. It has been translated from English into Spanish, French, German, Arabic, and Russian. Now teachers who pass our course receive their IHFD coaching license, which sets them on a clear path for professional development in the sport, with opportunities for some to work towards their IHFC coaching license. These multipliers are key to coach and player development in host countries and essential to our outreach. With this newfound emphasis on developing teachers similar to coaches, the Handball at School Working Group created a level and age appropriate comprehensive development model for children aged five to 18, as well as a methodological framework for developing players and coaches concurrently. And officially added an event day to our program to encourage teachers and schools to host more competitions. We will still have many festivals as part of our teacher evaluations on the third day of each course we believe thoughtfully designed age-appropriate events and competitions are essential for children's enrichment 
enjoyment, enthusiasm for the sport. And events are key to building successful programs. Whether they are in schools, clubs, or federations, we are creating interaction rituals, which are essential for culture building. We see this fact with professional, academic, and fraternal organizations, which come together for conferences, conventions, and meetings. In this area, children are no different than adults. They have similar social needs and desires. This is evident in the COVID era. As we learned yesterday from Professor Hamuda, events are key to this culture building process for children, providing them with an opportunity to create lasting memories. However, to understand how to build a thriving culture for them, we first need to understand what children want and need from sports. I will be stopping for questions in a few minutes, so please send them now or begin thinking about them and send them in a few minutes. What do children want from sports? When we look deeper, some interesting facts stand out. We learn children want to have fun. Children want to do something they are good at. They want to improve their skills and to get exercise and stay in shape. We know they want to be part of a team and most important, they want to be with their friends. This cannot be understated. Finally, they want to enjoy the excitement of competition. This is an important study to consider because winning does not even make the list. For children, it's about being together. In nearly all scientific studies, having fun is, the top of is at the top of children's wish lists for sports, especially for this age group. Again, remember, we're talking about five to 12 year olds. We're talking about young children and children right before adolescence which is why the fact that more than 70% of children stop playing organized sports by age 13 is so stunning. I feel this video perfectly represents the happy place for children while playing sports. And now we will look at their developmental milestones to understand better what sort of competitions are important for this age group. I really enjoy her. She's one of my favorite to have taught. According to the Canadian Sport for Life model, these, these marks or these uh, transitions in development are illustrative of several key points I need to make here. Although it is important that we discuss all of the stages, I believe narrowing our focus today on the first, first three stages will be very useful. Active start is an important foundation for children. This stage is, includes a lot of daily free play, exploration and diverse activities. Children should be encouraged to hang, climb, run, jump, throw, and crawl as much as possible, as our sand-covered friend playing on the beach shows us. The second stage, fundamentals, is a very important transition from free play to organized activities that focus on basic skills development. During this stage, children should experience a diversity of fun games and activities and should play as many sports as possible. However, they should never lose that childlike sense of exploration that they enjoyed during active start. The third stage, learn to train, is one of the most important stages in the entire process. During this stage, which precedes adolescence, children enjoy a great period of explosive skills development. Remembering what kids want, we know that competition for this group should focus on enjoyment and not winning. In later lectures, I will discuss the last four stages, but for now, it is important to understand what kids need for this age group. Fun, friends, and excitement. Before turning to a detailed breakdown of events and competitions, I will answer some of your questions. Uh, so far, we don't have any questions yet, so if you'd like to continue, then we can, hopefully we'll have some. <laughs> problem. I will continue. There are many events and competitions for children. We will focus on three in particular, leagues, tournaments, and festivals. In order to help guide you in selection and administration of events, and I will note here that our handball at school program has new posters for promotion and trifold brochures 
for better understanding the rules or for help with organizing events. Let's now turn to some key points about events that are relevant for this age group. Regarding festivals, leagues, and tournaments, we must consider these important points. Because our fair play principle is distinctive feature of handball, it is mainly through events where it is learned, tested, and reinforced. Again, I'm going to repeat that because this is an important aspect of handball. Because our fair play principle is a distinctive feature of handball, it is mainly through events where it is learned, tested, and reinforced. This means children have the opportunity to uh, work through all of the aspects that we have in handball that are unique to handball. This is important for the development of children. Events are also where our motto, fun, passion, and health can be experienced, especially outside the context of class or practice. And this is another key point because when we do our work in classrooms or gymnasiums, but within schools or within the club context, it's a different feeling, it's a different sense we, than, than when we have to experience it on the court. By hosting events, we acknowledge and reinforce the value of competition and celebrate interaction rules. In our new curriculum, events are also where teachers and coaches can properly evaluate their team and personal development. Especially for this age group, we must make events that focus on the children and not on the parents, teachers, coaches, or administrators. This is an important time to involve as many community members as possible and to reach new community members. When others see children enjoying themselves, they want their own children to feel the same. And in doing so, we grow our sport. And we must include children in many roles, some of which are shown in this graphic. These roles include referee, field players, table officials, substitutes, and sometimes even coaches. Although at this, the lower levels of this age bracket, I would not recommend that. We received a lot of questions yesterday regarding mini handball. And I think right now would be a good time to, to, to answer some of those. Mini handball is played on a court that is smaller than a handball court. This is essential for children because a large, the, the size of, the main, of a regulation court is too big for them to, to begin on. Their court is only 20 meters long and 13 meters wide. The goal area line can be made at a distance of four or five meters the mini handball goal is smaller too, and can be made from many materials, including metal, PVC, inflatable plastic, or a rectangle painted on the wall. One of my favorite um, times as a, when I go to schools to begin programs is to go into the closet of the teachers and to see what equipment they have and to make up rules for those, that equipment. It's a very easy thing to do. Anything can be used for a goal something to throw at. Mini handballs are smaller and often made from softer materials to ensure they can properly be held by children and reduce injury. The rules are modified, but I prefer to begin with these simple rules with new players. And these are the rules that I do at my mini handball festivals when I include teams that have never really played in gym class, but I want more children to participate. A player can take three steps. A player can hold the ball for three seconds and is allowed three feet of space when returning the ball into play. And because contact is discouraged, defenders should maintain an arm's length of distance from the attacker. All shots must be thrown from outside the goal area and the goalkeeper is only one allowed in the goal area. You will see with young children, defenders will want to wander into the space, but that is part of the learning process as they discover the court and its dimensions for themselves. This is all you need to get start playing. The rules are simple. Let's go through it again. Three steps, three seconds, three feet. No direct contact. Players must shoot from the outside the goal area and only the goalkeeper is allowed in the goal area. That's all you need to know to start playing handball. The basic game form for mini handball is 4v4 or 5v5. This means three goal, three court players and a goalkeeper or four court players and a goalkeeper. 
you can see in this video, it's a very fun and dynamic sport. It is played with full court pressure, which means no zonal defenses. The game is fast moving, high scoring, and enjoyable to play for children. And as Dr. Mustafa explained yesterday, children can easily play mini handball right away and they can improve quickly. I think this is a very important point. They can easily play mini handball right away and they will see uh, that they can improve very quickly. As we focus on the type of events, I'm now gonna break down three. I'm gonna work on leagues, tournaments and festivals. As I discuss leagues, I want you to remember that leagues are more local. So this means that they are important for children's development. They are snapshots taken over time. They provide important information for all involved. They are more local in nature and longer in duration, requiring cooperation between classes, schools, and regions. They involve authorities and institutions and are usually played during the whole school year or unit. When linked with the teaching unit or the training unit, leagues utilize checkpoints and testing opportunities. And this is very important because for teachers and coaches to evaluate their students and players and to evaluate themselves. Successful children's leagues celebrate their endings with a final four or championship game. Tournaments are different. They are a great unit end or season end event. They are also key tests for development as well. Tournaments emphasize competition, which is key to developing children's individual and group problem solving skills. Tournaments must level all competitive aspects, including size of courts, duration of games, quality of refereeing, and rest time between games. They involve a much larger community, which includes parents, administrators, and colleagues. Tournaments also require greater management and coordination between volunteers, teams, referees, and table officials. With mini handball tournaments, game lengths can be modified to suit the needs of the tournament. Now I've hosted lots of tournaments for children and adults. I've hosted national championships. I've hosted IHF trophy tournaments. The key to tournaments is managing the time and managing the players. <laughs> when you deal with adults and when you deal with children, it's different. Children need to be herded and controlled in a way that keeps the tournament moving. That's one of the key obstacles to tournaments with this age group is the difficulty in managing the children. And now we come to my favorite part. First and foremost, festivals are a celebration of the sport and are a key component in establishing successful handball programs. As Professor Hamuda explained yesterday, we must inspire friendship and love between kids and the game. I loved when he said this, we must inspire friendship and love between kids and the game. This must come across in our festivals. For children aged five to 12, festivals are the most important event we can hold. They are great unit end events. They involve colleagues, students, parents, all of them playing different roles. They are best when they incorporate different aspects of the sport, as you will see in the next slide, working in many sectors on complementary and supporting activities. Festivals are great for all levels, and I think by taking a closer look at them, you will believe so as well. You can convert any space into an event space. This includes gyms, grass or turf fields, and asphalt lots. 
you can also convert any court or playing field into event space. This includes basketball, tennis, and soccer. I've used wrestling rooms. I've used different, I'll use any surface I can find to create more opportunities. You can modify the rules to suit your needs. Sometimes I have used cafeterias and hallways for different fun children's activities. For festivals, as I said before, I believe it is important to incorporate different aspects of the sport. These include spaces for children to play their favorite small-sided games. And this is what's interesting because at Handball at School, the working group, our next book will be on these very small-sided games. Uh, and uh, we really look forward to really improving the quality of handball for children. And at a festival, it's a very opportune time to let the kids play these fun games. And we give them opportunities to play other forms of the sport, like mini beach handball and street handball. It is important to provide space and training equipment for teachers and coaches to present new methods. Again, I wanna say this, it is very important not to just focus on children during the festivals, but also to reward the teachers for their hard work. It is important to provide space and training equipment for teachers and coaches to present new methods. And to de designate space, for children for free play and to practice trick shots. Remember when we are at festivals, we're gonna have younger siblings and this is gonna be their first introduction to the sport. While their brother or sister are playing on the court, often we can create little games for the, the littlest of the kids uh, to do and to get them started as well. I will be stopping in a few moments to answer any questions. So please send them in. As you can see in this video, space can be easily divided into many components. I'm gonna let this video loop several times and pause here to really consider what's going on. We have areas for drills and exercises. We have areas for competition space. We have areas for small sided games and varied, techni and varied technical skills. These spaces are involving children in many aspects of handball. It is also fun to set up obstacle courses or to use diverse objects which challenge the children in new and intriguing ways. Again, I want you to watch this. Look at the different spaces. We have drills, we have competition space, we have exercises, we have small-sided games. You know, small-sided games are great because they work on small group co cooperation but they're often outside the context of handball. With festivals, you are only limited by your imagination. I think this is an effect, this video is important because it's a very effective use of space. It doesn't need to be just playing courts. It needs to be many spaces, especially for festivals. I'll loop it one more time. I think here's a good time to talk about a success story and to understand what we can learn from it. A little bit of the backstory, more than a decade ago, the Alberta Team Handball Federation was formed in one of Canada's westernmost provinces. It was founded on the premise that building a strong mini handball program was essential for organizational growth. In the beginning, it was much work hosting school clinics, convincing teachers, and getting people involved. Today, they have more than 50 participating schools competing in eight regional mini handball festivals, concluding with a provincial championship that fields as many as 65 teams. I think that's incredible that within 10 years, they have uh, uh, 65 teams that are finalists for provincial championships. From this space, they built an amazing foundation of 3000 club level players. 
and an elite core of 100 provincial and national team players. Again, that number is staggering to me that they've in 10 years have built a program that supports 3000 club level players. This year, when they decided to start a mini handball league, they fielded more than 300 players in this U13 category. They are an excellent example of a strong handball culture. And I hope they inspire you to do the same. I will pause here to answer any questions. Okay, we have a few now. So let's begin with, well, somebody asked if at a competition, would it be okay to do an official competition with three against three and four against four for children instead of a full team? Yeah, well, so I spoke about that before. Uh, it's very important you don't do a full team with children. It's very important, uh, especially in this five to 12, the most we should have is four court players and four uh, defend uh, and uh, a goalkeeper at most at this age group. The reasons are many. You want them to enjoy the sport. And if there's six v six on the court, there's less opportunity to be in, t in contact with the ball, less excitement and joy. And what ends up happening is one or two kids end up you know, doing most of the work. When you come down to 4v4, which I prefer for the younger group that we're talking about today, 3v3 uh, three court players, and then as you get to the 10 to 12 group, you go to four court players. Um, it just opens up play, allows for the, the game to be to, to not lag in offensive and defensive phases, but becomes more fast paced. And the more kids you add to the court, the more uh, phase based the, the, the play becomes, and that's more tedious and less fun for children. And they, and they have less, every time you're on the ball, you're learning new technical and tactical skills. And so it's important that we have as many touches as possible for the kids. Um, okay, just talking about the fun for children. Somebody asked uh, about how to make it fun. Uh, but I think part of the point is that it, it, it is fun. It is inherently fun. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about why do you think children enjoy handball from your experience? What is it that helps? Well, well I, th I think what helps, I think one of them, and this comes back to points that were made yesterday, is that mini handball is essentially an attractive game for children. Often I leave, uh, when I first introduce them to the sport, I leave balls in the middle of the court and just let them kind of explore to themselves and slowly build rules for them. Um, but it, it's an easy sport to play from the start. So it's, it's it, like the rules I spoke about, three steps, three seconds, three feet. And all that matters is that the kids get out there. And, and if you have to ask my honest opinion, I prefer a less legalistic uh, refereeing structure for children. Mm -hmm. If they have four steps, so what? If, if, the, if you stop the natural flow of the game every time they make a mistake they're not going to enjoy the sport and so i feel like for children you become flexible in how you you know in a tournament that would be different but in a festival if i'm refereeing a game which i often do the kids always laugh because they'll come running by and they're like thanks for that extra step <laughs> you know <laughs> because it was more important for me that they got the shot on goal than to have, you know, as a seven-year-old, than to have me stop the play and say, you did it wrong. And I think that's where it becomes fun in this moment where people, uh, where children get to experience what we all love about the sport, which is how dynamic, how fast paced. And we really need to keep it within that context for them to continue with the sport, in my opinion. Okay, we have a, a few questions about children with special needs. Um, one person mentioned that in Venezuela, in their project, they are involving children with special needs at a young age with all the children. Uh, someone else asked about how a coach or a, a teacher can make sure these children are feeling involved. Can you talk a bit about this? Well, what's interesting, that's, I work in several districts that are larger districts. Um, one of our district is an embedded district, which means 
the physical education of, of, of students with disabilities happens simultaneous and in the same space as the, uh, the kids without. And I always have to create curriculum for dual curriculum for both. So I'll have one group, but what I often do in the, in a competition context is I have a pause moment. I'll call timeout and I will set up a situation in which the children with disabilities that uh, need to be protected, again, going back to the fast paced dynamic, kids run with their heads down. So that it can be a dangerous moment. And I find the timeout pause, setting up a situation in which this, this student or player can then step into what I would call a safe environment, but a dynamic environment that's at their level. Mm -hmm. And children are great. I'll be honest with you in the blended districts, children have no problem. They, they become, they participate, they come here, pass, pass. And they, they really get involved in a way that is, that is exciting because they have been in this blended situation before and they understand that this is a natural part of it. Mm -hmm. um, in districts where they are separated, it's more difficult because the access isn't, it's a separate class completely. And so you're, you, you pretty much are teaching very uh, basic uh, and foundational skills. So. Um, okay, let's do one more before we move on. Um, somebody asked about dribbling for children. It, do you think this is a important, it, maybe this in senior handball, it's a bit of a different view of it. Is it important for the children? skill <laughs> so my honest opinion is this the youngest player restricting dribbling or limiting dribbling is important for learning handball at a younger age especially in the context of context of practice in the context of class mm -hmm. what we often find with dribbling is that players who are who who first pick it up are the ones that only use it and no, don't include other, if I can just dribble straight down the court, why should I have to give and go and with the pass with a teammate? And wanting to involve more people, I find it's important to restrict dribbling in some form. I usually start, I, I, I sometimes teach classes where I don't begin dribbling really till the third lesson. And the kids are like, wait, we could have dribbled? <laughs> and they all seem very surprised, but I wanted them to first understand working together. The small group uh, cooperation is very important for teaching handball. And it's also very important for teaching kids to work together. So these are some of our basic components. And uh, I begin with no dribble. I'll go to one dribble mm -hmm. and then I'll go to three dribbles and then I'll go to unlimited. Once I know that they understand that two people passing the ball back and forth are way more effective than one person with their head down dribbling down the court. So, so that's, that's my take on dribbling. I, 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 and it might be a very American thing because I teach in schools where basketball, mm -hmm. the second I allow dribbling all the bad habits from basketball come back into place in some countries where basketball is not as strong as it is here. Maybe you can begin teaching that skill or should begin teaching that skill a little sooner. Mm -hmm. um, but I just feel it inhibits uh, cooperation between players, which is one of the foundations of our sport or de developing players in our sport. For sure. Um, okay, I think we should continue and then we'll see some more at the end. Okay. So back to the presentation. Um, I really wanna talk about uh, at this point, uh, playing different roles. Uh, for children and why that's so important. By hosting events, we give opportunities for our students and players to develop in these different roles. These roles include referees and table officials to be that are the most important. These learning opportunities are important and offer children a valuable and different perspective of the sport, especially for table officials who begin to see the game from a different perspective. It also helps to develop decision-making, analysis of situations, and appreciation or application of the rules. This is especially true for referees. It teaches them critical conflict resolution and problem-solving skills, 
as we will see in the subsequent video, and to develop alternative skills. These skills can lead to new career paths and they, after they are done as a player. And this is an important point that when we create programs, not everyone's gonna remain as a player. We need referees, we need table officials, we need people that are fans in the stands. And so allowing kids to experience different roles during events helps broaden their opportunities later. Here, we're gonna watch a video uh, of uh, the boy refereeing his friends. Here you can see him making an easy call when a player violates the no contact rule. And then we can see him making the not so easy call when a player violates the three steps rule. <laughs> and I'm gonna loop this video several times so you can watch it, because I really want you to watch how he has to work on problem solving after he, he uh, after he calls out his friend for steps, another teammate disagrees with him. These tools are vital for children's development. And as Professor Hamuda explained yesterday, this is something uniquely woven into the fabric of mini handball. That's what makes our sport great. I'm gonna let you sit there and watch it a few more minutes, how important this role is for this young man to play referee. And as you can see, he now has to deal with his friend being mad at the call. This is important opportunities for them to learn. It's also important for teachers. By hosting events for children, we are also working to develop our teachers, giving them inspiration and motivation to improve themselves and their methods by also becoming coaches and referees and table officials themselves. They also develop by participating in physical education conventions and by attending teaching and coaching conferences. The goal of this program is to open up new career pathways, to help others see handball as an exciting opportunity and to inspire the next generation of teachers by becoming ambassadors of the sport. I think this is an important thing that we, we really need to offer them. You know, teachers want opportunities. I, I find many of them go right into refereeing for me. Several go into coaching and some uh, have gone on to be national team coaches that started out as teachers and programs with mine. By utilizing events and competitions that are specifically designed for children in this age group, we can create a more enjoyable sporting experience for everyone involved. We can improve the quality of our in-school and after-school programs. We expose more community members to the sport. We improve participation, retention, and growth rates. And we foster better development of players, students, teachers and coaches. And most important, we secure a bright future for handball. I very much appreciate your time today. And I wanna acknowledge the work of my colleagues at the IHF office and also on the Handball at School Working Group. And I would like to take any more of your questions that you have right now. Okay, sorry, I'm just assessing the last ones that are coming in. Okay. No problem. So, we have a lot of questions about age. Um, so, first of all, people asked, what do you suggest as the earliest age to start playing handball? Playing handball? I think that uh, what I talked about before with from active start five or six years old is the earliest time to have them exposed to what I would call the practice model or the teaching model, uh, which is like a more sport specific aspect. I think it is important that children in that first group, those the, that I talked about the active start children. So before five or six are, learn to have fun and be active more so than to be structured and controlled. 
Um, I, I think as we go into the second group, which is basically five to eight years old, they should be, they should experience handball as a series of, as a series of mini games instead of drills. There should be no drills for children five to eight. Uh, they can work on tactile stuff with the ball and manipulation. They can do that and they, they can learn to, to become one with the ball, but they shouldn't wait in line. They shouldn't be, it's really key. We talk about this in our book. It's really key for children of this age group, especially the five to eight, which would be their first introduction to organized sports to have a, a, a truly enjoyable experience more so than to learn handball. Professor Hamuda spoke about that yesterday and uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Hapkova and I will uh, discuss that tomorrow in our talk about motivation. But earliest I would say to be exposed to real sport-like practice models would be uh, somewhere between five and eight. Okay, then we have a few people asking, what do you think is the ideal age where kids to start to specialize? Are, if we're, are we talking to specialize in positions? Uh, first specialize in handball and then specialize in positions. <laughs> well, this is a very, this, I have strong feelings on this matter. I have very strong feelings. I've been writing a book called The Team Handball Academy Way, which really discusses my philosophies on this. I think specialization for sports and for positions should be delayed as long as possible. I'll give you an example. Until everyone has had uh, puberty, you will never truly know what position they should be. I always use the example of my own son who was a late bloomer. And so he was the smallest kid when we went to Sweden and at the Partile Cup and we put him at wing and he only played wing. And now he's taller than almost everyone on that team. Mm -hmm. And it was a situation where he grew into a different position and and it's important for him to have that opportunity to grow into a different position and if all he knew was how to do wing play it wouldn't be as strong and so from from my my standpoint you delay sports specialization and positional specialization as long as possible and to go to the first point which is the sport i really strongly believe that each sport develops and science has shown this develops a neural pathway that is unique to itself and only until the brain uh, goes into the myelinates later in life for girls it's a little bit younger than boys um, do the do the sports kind of merge and the more neural pathways you create through sport experience through activity the better you'll be as an adult and so that's kind of a scientific way to look at it but I really feel specialization is not something you should focus on. For We're talking about five to 12, kids should play every position on the court. And uh, just to add to that for everyone's information, also the head coach of the German youth age category national teams, Jochen Beppler, he did some lectures for us during the first IHF live online symposium. And he also spoke about this and he completely agreed with Craig's viewpoint that it should be quite late. Uh, you can access those lectures also on the IHF Education Center for the people who are very interested in this topic. Um, so next question. Okay, we have people asking about the length of time for training sessions and matches for children. What would you suggest? So, so uh, let's start with the first category, five to eight. Five to eight should be 30 to 45 minutes maybe a couple times a week. You should encourage families to play, do other activities with that age group as well during the week. But it, it, you, can't, you can't expect them, as Professor Hamuda talked about the difference in blood volume and all that, you, you can't expect them to play a two hour practice or a 90 minute game. Um, I prefer with the youngest kids to play one single game that's not a half, maybe seven to 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't like to have bigger teams in competition because I, I don't want them to be subbing in and out. Mm -hmm. So four or five players, maybe six per team, but allowing them to have uh, a real dynamic experience that's appropriate for their size um, and age. Um, when you go to the older groups, 
um, my in, in my own academy. That's an, the the second group is is really a, a critical stage of development. Like I said before, it's an explosive time of skills development. All of the sweet spots of motor functioning come align. For girls, they align a little bit sooner than boys, but it's important to know that as the sweet spots align, we can do a lot with a little. I say this all the time. If you give me a 25 year old who's an elite athlete and I have to teach him handball, it will take me five times as long to develop him as a 12 year old. Mm -hmm. 12 year olds are astounding and they can leave the sport for four years and come back when they made the choice to come to handball. And it's like riding a bike for them. They never lost it. Mm -hmm. Puberty changes that because of all the massive growth and the stress that puts on the body and the brain. It's not an optimal time to teach skills development, mm -hmm. but this, this 10 to 12 year old age bracket is one of my favorites. I love coaching these kids. They can do a lot, they work hard, and they can be given a little bit longer practice time. So you can look at the 90 minutes with maybe a discussion and a break built in. But they're okay. wonderful workers and they, they just really try so hard at that age group. I really love that age group. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, okay, just to follow up, someone's asked a follow up question about uh, children up to the age of 15, 16. So they said, so then in line with what you've said about specialization being later. So does that mean the preparation up until that point should be very multifaceted and the children should be just trying as many positions as possible? And I, 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 I seriously encourage coaches all the time to step outside of these limiting confines of positions. Each position has a, a technical and tactical base beneath them. To play the position beside them, it's important to know what that player is experiencing. And so I always say this to people, it's you're, you can't just be trained as a pivot without knowing the difficulty from the backcourt player to pass to the pivot. Until that links in my head, from my experience of playing the backcourt, can I truly understand what that player needs from me and what I need from them? And so it's this kind of interplay and relationships on the court. And if we don't learn all the positions fully, that means playing uh, right wing as a, as a righty and left wing as a lefty, learning how that side of the court works with a, a, a player, until we learn to play pivot, even if I'm small, even if I'm, I don't have the anthropomorphic profile that we consider like ideal for pivot, it's important for that player to know because when that player goes then to play playmaker, they know the struggle that the pivot's going through. They know the, the importance of see, having eye contact, of establishing kind of an unspoken connection with players at that position. And so these are important things that if you only put, okay, I've got a tall right-handed kid, he's my left back. I have a tall left-handed kid, he's my right back. That, that lefty should learn to play every position. He should learn to play lefty from the right back or from the left back position. It's important to know. And so from my standpoint, as you go into 14, 15, 16, which the original question asked, it is very important that players in that group, because puberty is just going on, play all positions. And I'll give you another example. I had a kid came to me at 13, looked like a grown man, never grew again. Everybody passed him, but at 13, you thought he was going to be the left back of the future for our program. He played in Pan American Championships. He played on the national team, but he didn't grow again. He looked older at 13 than several of my assistant coaches who were in college. It was a very funny point for us, but puberty is the great equalizer. He was at 13 because he advanced so quickly through puberty. He didn't have to rely on technical skills because he had strength, stamina. He had that, what I would call that adult regimen for being able to play handball. But as the players that were late bloomers, had to work on technical and tactical, had to be crafty, had to really think it through. When everything was equal, those kids were better. 
And in a lot of ways, I feel I failed that player because I thought his early puberty was a reflection of my abilities as a coach. And it was actually a reflection of my inabilities as a coach, which is always difficult. Yeah. And for everybody that's out there, I don't come from the modern handball epicenter of Europe. I come from a developing nation. I know what you go through. I know your experience as well. I know what it's like to walk into a school and have them think you're going to go play racquetball without a racket. They'd never heard of the sport before. So I understand what it's like to bring kids to the sport that have never heard of it. Um, okay. Uh, let me just see. Okay, so somebody asked, what about if you're doing handball with the children not on a court? Um, I, I think mainly the person is kind of talking about adjusting according to what resources you have. This person asked specifically about dribbling if you're not on a court. But what I think is interesting to consider more is what about people who don't have access to a handball court for children or how, what are the adaptations we can recommend? How can we help people to adjust to what they have available? Well, I included on this slide that's up right now, uh, pictures from uh, grass, uh, girls grass tournaments that I do. And so it's, uh, I allow a single bounce dribble in those tournaments, which means they can get that extra, you know, they just bounce it up to themselves. They're not really dribbling because you can't dribble on grass. And with the, the ball I use, it's a softer ball, but it has good uh, properties for bounce. And so it, it, it comes back to them. You just have to be creative. I, 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 my favorite, I said it before and I'll say it again. My favorite job that I do is opening up for the first time the closet of PE teachers and seeing what equipment they have and considering, all right, I have this mini game. I'll give you an example. I have a mini game in which on poly spots, which are flat rubber spots, you put bowling pins and it's a game where the kids are targeting those in an area. I went into someone's closet. They didn't have poly spots or bowling pins, but they had American footballs and the tees that they do the kickoff from. And I was like, same concept. And I just used the, the, the football to, uh, as a bowling pin, and that's what they knocked off the tees. And so you just have to be creative in everything you do. If you have space, use it. If your ceiling's not, uh, not high enough, uh, restrict the type of passing, go to bounce passing. I've done this. I do this in cafeterias. Sometimes I use this extra space, the cafeterias and the hours before they're serving and after or after they're serving lunches. And the cafeteria ceilings are as low as the one I'm in right now. And so we only do bounce passes. There's no throwing the ball. It's only bounce passes if you're going to pass to a teammate. And so it, you just have to be flexible and you have to be creative. I mean, in, in, especially in developing countries that don't have it, uh, the equipment, you can make anything into a goal. You can, I, have, I have made goals out of funniest things ever. I wish I should, you should see some of the broomstick ones I've made and in, in gone and propped them in cones and taped them. Whatever I can make into a goal, I will. Because the same basic principles are there. The kids are going to shoot at it and the goalie is going to try to stop it. Nothing's changed. It's just not as pretty. <laughs> but. Um, okay, somebody asked, do you think parent participation in mini handball helps to motivate kids? Participation in the program, like supporting it or participation in the actual like? I suppose uh, let's go with supporting the program. I think, I, well, I, parents are key. Parents are either an ally or a detriment in many cases, and there's not a lot in between. Um, uh, it's very difficult to please all parents. <laughs> and so they, they carry an inherent bias for their own child with them. Mm -hmm. And that becomes reflective in all interactions as a teacher or a coach that you have. As a youth and junior national team coach, I, deal with parents all the time, but that's a different context. 
in the context of, of, of what I would consider in my program, a recreational or developmental program, uh, uh, the parents, uh, I try to uh, make them allies of the program and have them involved. It's important to have parents involved. It's important for kids to see their parents being involved in their sporting lives because that's a great influencer on them being lifelong active, being enjoying physical literacy for their entire lifespan is you in a lot of cases set by the relationship to activity that they saw in their parents mm -hmm. in, in, in a lot of cases. So, so I think parents need to be involved. It's always more complicated. <laughs> it's always, I speak at national conferences for youth sports and, and uh, so many of my Q and A's veer to the parent discussion. I always suggest that these, that you have a parent contract that says, this is our expectations of you. This is what we need from you. And it always seems to, I would say it, it in most cases, it, 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 it allows them to feel part of the group, but also have clear boundaries because it becomes complicated. I know in some developing countries, it's even more complicated because of uh, uh, just the differences from one, one community to the next. So always an interesting question <laughs> with many answers. <laughs> uh, okay, wait, let's do one more. Um, sorry, I just have some more coming in. Um, Somebody asked uh, for this young age group, do you think, this is more of a yes or no question, but I'm hoping you can expand on your answer a bit. <laughs> um, if uh, for young children are perception and decision-making some of the key things we should be, or that are being developed when children are starting with handball? Well, decision-making is all, if you're talking about the youngest group. So I will say, uh, perception and decision making are important. Uh, with the youngest group, this five to eight year olds, it's really important that we focus on broadly developing skills in which it's not really decision making. Like I, I'll give you an example. I, I do this awesome thing with like four and five year olds because I had to create something because I had them attending camps and I needed to come up with programming that was fun for them, but yet still in involved aspects of handball and some levels of decision making and it would be i would put out uh what, what the, the the low profile trainer discs and set balls on them they would retrieve them but then they would have to to then choose a partner to then go out and run and place it somewhere else and they were competing against another group of kids doing the same thing and each time it was decision making but really the only thing we were focusing on is the, the, the skill, the basic skills of movement, of picking up the ball, of placing it, that's all we were focused on. With other children, and when you go into this, the, the what I call the 10 to 12 year olds, um, uh, I think decision-making is, is, they're about to go into puberty and about to lose the ability to make good decisions. I think decision-making is key for that group. Learning cooperation, learning recognition, learning, you know, learning how to recognize the situation, to read it, and to to be creative in their response to it, is a really fun part of this ten to twelve year old group. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I love, like I said before, this is one of my favorite groups. Mm -hmm. When they become, when they go into the teenage years, and 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 this really what I consider this bridge from adolescent or from from. Uh, from young children to adolescence, uh, Professor Hamuda spoke about it yesterday when he talked about they can flip on a dime on their emotions. You just, you never know what's gonna happen. And you wanna press them in decision-making, but you don't wanna make a situation too complex or too far beyond their present abilities to solve it. I think that's the key. If I can say anything within decision-making and within perception, you always want to make something that's just beyond their current abilities. So it's not a, it's not a bridge too far for them to solve it, but decision-making is key and you always need to be 
creating practice plans and teaching plans that have embedded in them a, co a core component of decision making. Like for me, I use with my, my 14 to 18 year olds, uh, progressive exercises. So there's a base for each of these, they're like mini games or drills, but they're complex. And at the base is a simple form. And I add at each time a new layer or wrinkle that they have to, a new, a new uh, objective for them in each level. And so it takes what they already know and they trust in that. And I press them to make a new decision based on new parameters, a new objective. And it's, and it's fun. And so I think you have to train, the, especially the 10 to 12 year olds to be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And you do that with how you design your teaching units or your uh, practice plans. It's, that's really key and fundamental to it all. They, you need to be, th everyone needs to be more thoughtful about how they go about developing children and less worried about hitting perfect milestones because mm -hmm. it's adaptive. It, each group is different. I go, I'll, I'll end with this. I go to schools in the district nearby. There's eight elementary schools, which means kids up to 11. For some reason, there is one of the schools, the girls are just amazing athletes. And I go to another school and the kids can't even throw and catch to each other. I don't know why that happens within a community that's probably eight miles separated, but it, everything's different and you have to take what you have and, and help it develop. You, you can't, you'll never get what you want. You'll only have what you have. So that's the best I can tell you. <laughs> I think that's all very informative. All right, we will end there. Um, thank you so much, Craig. It's very thank you. informative. Uh, so everybody, just to let you know what's coming up tomorrow, Craig will be back also with our Hamble at School Working Group Chairwoman, Dr. Ilona Hapkova. Uh, that's again at 2 p.m. Central European Summer Time. Uh, and that is on motivating children to play handball. So we will be back again tomorrow at 2. See you tomorrow, Craig. Thank you again. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. See you tomorrow.